Our next speaker is Emo Todorov, who is joining us from somewhere in Seattle. And he will tell us exactly where in a minute. Uh, Emo has been working at that intersection of learning and control and robotics for, for many years now, and has really kind of uh, uh, done, done a lot of amazing work, both on the mathematical side and the implementation side, and also notably has built uh, one of the most popular simulators for understanding um, motor control. So with that, Emo. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, OK, so I'll start with some uh, high-level comments and then get into these new methods that I want to talk to you about. Um, optimization, which is what we all do, is powerful, but not magic. In particular, when you have systems uh, that involve contact dynamics, contacts are both complicated, but also they're the thing that gives you control authority and actuation and ability to move the things that you want. So very often you have optimization landscapes that, that actually look uh, like this. There is a part in the search space where it's trajectories or controls or policy parameters where the good things happen. And if your optimizer gets there, it can basically do refinement, which is what optimizers are good at. But the very large parts of the search space where nothing happens, simply because you're not in contact with the things you need to manipulate, and refining some movement that doesn't make contact gives you no improvement in cost or reward, but it gives you uh, control costs, so basically there's no local information to take you there. So you can expect optimization to do refinement, but discovery is something that op optimization just doesn't do, and people in classical AI tried to do for half a century and couldn't quite figure it out, so it's still a wide open problem. Um, now, this is not just a cartoon example, it happens all the time. Can somebody turn on that clock so I can see what's going on? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Good, now uh, my time just started. I should have told you later. <laughs> uh, and Russ is still working on his talk, so we're fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's an example where this actually happens all the time. This is the uh, work that we published last year. So here are a few behaviors. So we tra trained neural networks to perform these things. So this is a 30 degree freedom hand reaching grasping objects, and it can do it to multiple. Uh, locations. So this, uh, this is a neural network trained with policy gradients working in a certain way. I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, we can reorient objects similar to like the OpenAI uh, task. We can like, pick up hammers and hit nails. This is all done in that Muchoku simulator that uh, Ben uh, mentioned briefly. Uh, so this all seems to work and it's so good fun, but if you, look, if you just do reinforcement learning with uh, what's called a sparse reward, which basically you, you design a cost function that says what, what you want and the policy gradient, these first uh, three tasks, hammering, opening a door, and moving an object, actually it never gets anywhere. Why? Because it's in this regime where there is no local information to lead, whether it's sampling or gradient descent. Ironically, this is the only thing that uh, reinforcement learning actually solves out of the box, which is kind of funny because this is would, would seem to be the most complex control problem of this. Now, if you start shaping it, you can like change that landscape here if you're good at that. What we did in this paper was we found that if we provide a small number of demonstrations from a human usually, then and you uh, design an optimization method to optimize the task cost plus stay close to those trajectories, that actually dramatically improves performance, but now you're downloading knowledge from the human brain to the learner. So most of the time what people do is just hack this and hope nobody notices, meaning that people somehow initialize their system here and pretend that they didn't. If you want to do it systematically, you can do some of those things. Ideally, we would find a way to do automatic domain-specific discovery that goes beyond what we understand as optimization. Why domain-specific? Because if it was general, then you would be solving global search, and obviously you could never do that. We'll talk a bit more later about how we might do this discovery in the case of contacts. Another point is that even if you are in that refinement regime, you might think that we have sampling merits and we're done, but that's actually not the case, as I'll illustrate shortly. So first, the good news. Here's our latest and greatest. This was just presented I clear. It's a new method called plan online, learn offline. Basically, the idea is we're doing model predictive control with uh, pi squared with sampling method. And then in addition to that, we're learning optimal value function approximator. And we're using that on the horizon of, of MPC and we're iterating between the two. So that works rather well. Here are two examples. The task here is to move this cube. And this guy figures out how to go push the cube and then make the cube stop. And the cube is kind of slippery, so he has to do this rather heroic maneuver at the end to make it stop. <laughs> and uh, this is the OpenAI task, just running continuously. So 
uh, we give it a target orientation and the hand figures out what to do. The shaking is courtesy of a sampling method, namely pi squared, because uh, our MPC is based on that. But the value function approximator on the horizon helps it a lot. So that's the good news. We can do this somewhere between 10 and 100 times more sample efficient than what, what OpenAI did. Here's the bad news. All you have to do to break this is turn the hand upside down. So absolutely nothing happens. It cannot get off the ground. Why? Well, that's not the question to ask. The question is, why did sampling ever work in the first place? And the reason sampling works, actually, is, is situations where safe exploration is possible, not in the, safe of, in the, case of, uh, in, not in the sense of not breaking the physical system, but in the sense of not causing some catastrophic failure in simulation where you cannot even continue like dropping an object. And also you want to be in a situation where kind of sloppy controllers have a chance to succeed in, in, at least in principle. And that's usually hidden in the papers that, that you read. I mean, this is just negative results nobody wants to publish, but the reality is that these sampling merits are significantly more limited than what my, you might be led to believe. Even in some of our earlier work, so for example, we used to, uh, we did a few projects with uh, Sergey Levin and people at Berkeley and uh, uh, running some of these merits on real robots, and it's funny, <laughs> you might think we thought deeply about the algorithms, but we didn't, we knew what the algorithms are. The deep thinking was the following. What mechanical contraption do we design such that the objects stay there and don't fly away and the robot can do safe exploration? If you can design some clever contraption, you can get sampling off the ground. If you cannot, you're stuck, like shown here. Uh, one more slightly pessimistic point. Trajectory optimization is good, but it's complicated. Uh, let me just show you some of our earlier work on trajectory optimization. This is MPC in Mujoku done in real time. Uh, seven years ago, this humanoid is asked to stand up and these red forces are throwing it around and it's figuring out what to do with iterative LQR with a planning horizon of about half a second. Here's some unicycle guy driving around. Here we actually have a GUI for changing weights of cost terms online and cost shaping is kind of important for these things. Here's a hand that's going to grasp an object somewhere and NPC figures out what to do with all the fingers. Um, we also did a lot of the work on something called contact invariant optimization, which I'll talk about in more detail in this talk. But basically, this is an offline planning method that plans the whole trajectory and has a clever way to plan contact interactions, which enable it to generate movies like that, like completely automatically with what you would call a sparse reward. You can like climb over obstacles, it can uh, whatever. Two characters with a shared brain can pass objects to each other. Um, can have a little guy climbing on top of a big guy. So here just the cost says that the little guy has to get his head up there. You can have hands doing stuff. This is one of my favorite. Um, you could also be able to run that on the real robot. So here what we did is we're planning trajectory with uh, the CIO method with respect to an ensemble of 10 models of that little robot and then executing them on the robot. If you just plan with respect to a nominal robot, it fails because the model is wrong. But if you plan with respect to 10 different models and you ask for a trajectory to be feasible with respect to all of them, it actually works on the real system reasonably well. This is particularly nice, getting, off the, getting up from the table. Um, so these things do pretty amazing stuff. And there are others, for example, Peter Bill's classic work on helicopter flying around, that was, that was MPC. Evangelos Theodoros' work on cars racing around, that, that's MPC. Um, so trajectory optimization does work, and when we did this like seven years ago, that was way ahead of actually deep learning was not even a thing at the time, and DeepMind was just getting founded. So you would have thought that people would have used these techniques as a starting point, but that's not at all what happened, right? Very few people actually replicated or extended this work, mostly because that requires careful engineering while reinforcement learning is just easier, and people prefer to do what's easy as long as it kind of works. Um, but the good news is that this careful engineering can be done once and then reused, and, and that's what I've been trying to do over the past three years. So I'm actually, my focus right now is not to write uh, papers. I mean, my students still write papers. My focus is to actually write software that makes stuff work so people stop doing insane sampling and start doing something more sensible. Um, the software has a GUI, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. It has a optimization SDK, it actually is a very elaborate thing. So it has like a dynamic workspace around it, similar to like a MATLAB workspace. It has optimization server multiple clients. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, it's based on top of the Muchoku simulator, which can simulate all kinds of uh, things that a lot of people are using. So here you can drag these humanoids, you can simulate all kinds of robots, you can 
to whatever things. You can throw humanoid on the MATLAB peaks function. <laughs> you can throw a bunch of spheres. You can tie ropes these days. They're like, this is a hammock. You can throw our friend the humanoid on a hammock. Um, you can do, there's some soft, spongy objects these days that you can press. Like, hold on, let me do this again. I think it's a spongy thing. You can do tendon-driven humanoids, throw them around. So um, this thing is now quite widely used, and, it, and it's pretty fast. The forward dynamics to, to compute the contact forces comes down to convex optimization problem, and that's the case with every modern physics simulator. So if you look at physics or ODE or bullet or any of those things, when you try to simulate one step, it, there's actually an optimization problem that needs to be solved in order to compute contact forces. There's no analytical formula for that. Uh, actually, most other engines are non-convex. The nice thing about Mujoku is that uh, because it uses soft constraints, it actually has well-defined inverse dynamics, meaning that even in the presence of contact, if you give me the positions, velocity, and accelerations, I can recover both the applied forces and the contact forces, and they're uniquely defined just because the contacts are soft. Uh, now it has analytical derivatives that are not released yet, and so the new methods I'm going to talk about, they heavily use this inverse dynamics and the fact that it's analytically solvable and smooth and, and differentiable. Uh, in order to optimize, you need cost functions. Uh, you could let users write those in Python, and that's a mistake uh, for a number of reasons. I won't go through it, but basically, I'm, I'm designing a, cost a language for little cost functions, which are designed to be Gauss-Newton friendly. So the general term is you, you have a you have a linear combination of terms. The terms are you pick some features that depend on the physics and geometry. You can provide some reference values. You can scale them in some ways, and you can apply loss functions that don't to scale, so you can put constraints, you can optimize cycle trajectories, you can pin some things. Importantly, there's like a little XML language for specifying cost functions by essentially choosing from a library of things and, and defining parameters. And that allows it to want the derivatives to be evaluated internally and propagated just like, like think of it as a TensorFlow for optimal control, basically, that's what it's doing. Uh, also, it can be multi-traded, and, and the user is not going to mess up the derivatives, which is a big concern when you let users write cost functions. Um, now, let me talk about uh, algorithms briefly. So, the core algorithm is uh, direct uh, optimization. Uh, what does acceleration base mean? Very simple. I'm using inverse dynamics instead of forward dynamics. If you have forward dynamics, the input is force, and the output is acceleration, and then you integrate. And you, when you have contacts, the relationship between force acceleration is not at all linear. It's Let's say it's piecewise linear, but the number of pieces is exponential in the number of active contacts, and that's why you, we need these numerical solvers. Uh, inverse dynamics goes the other way. Input is acceleration, output is force. So when you work with, when you optimize through inverse dynamics, you treat the acceleration as your control signal, and, and that's your decision variable, and everything I'm doing is based on that. So a simple case, we're just go, are going to parameter the sequence of positions, use finite difference in time to get velocities and accelerations, run inverse dynamics to get forces, as well as contact forces and everything else, contact Jacobians, whatever, and defectors, tendons, such. You define some trajectory cost, which is some of some running costs over time that can depend on everything. You can put um, constraints on the output of forward dynamics to enforce actuation constraints, and then uh, I'm using like augmented Lagrangian Gauss-Newton method. One notable thing here is that you have a cost on this big object, but that, the Hessian of that cost is band diagonal because this thing is a sum over little terms that uh, over time. It may become an arrowhead matrix when you're optimizing cyclic trajectories, but still the number of non-zeros here grows linearly with the time step. So the computational complexity of these things is actually linear in, in the time step. It's cubic in the number of degrees of freedom, but that's usually not big. It's the number of time steps that could kill you. So let's uh, quickly look, uh, see one of those things in action. I'm going to load a little hopper here. And here's my little hopper. So I'm initializing it with, so this is supposed to hop. The way the task is encoded is I'm going to pin two states uh, and I'm going to interpolate linearly between them. That's the initialization. And now I'm going to run my optimizer by pressing run. And, oh, that take, took almost a second. Is that because there's PowerPoint running the parent? Okay, 0 0.8 seconds, whatever. So, uh, so now I have a happy hopping trajectory. Um, 
and I, I can go and explore quite uh, all kinds of things that happen. So this, this was the initialization. Uh, what this GUI is doing, so these are all the iterations of the algorithm it actually got saved. In fact, you can see how the whole trajectory evolved over iterations. Uh, and here you can, you can plot all kinds of things. You can see how the cost and the actuation error goes down. This is a very interesting thing. This is the gradient. You can see my mouse pointer at the bottom right. So the gradient itself is plotted as trajectory. These are degrees of freedom. These are time steps. You can see these spiky things. What's up with those spiky things? Well, these are the points in time where some contact forces changed rapidly, okay? So the gradients in that space are really nasty. If you try to do stochastic gradient descent or even first order gradient descent with a line search on that gradient, you're not going to get anywhere. It sounds bad. Here's the good news. If you multiply by the Hessian inverse, the search directions look like that. And this is search direction over iteration. So what Newton method does, it takes a really spiky, nasty gradient signal and turns it into a very nice search direction that gives you this uh, continuous trajectory deformations and then you can do line search over those and, and optimize very quickly. So in like less than a second, you can, you can optimize uh, this sort of thing. Here's a second example. This is just a simple acrobot. The reason I, I'm showing it to you, we'll see in a moment. So um, here is a little acrobot. Let's just run it. This takes 65 milliseconds and uh, it invents that trajectory for starting nothing, hanging down. Let's compare this to pi squared, which is a sampling method. It can solve this. Mm, you, it's animating the final state of the trajectory that it's solving. Okay, so this took exactly 100 times longer and produced a trajectory that's almost as good. It's actually, the cost is slightly worse. Uh, I've, I promise you I've optimized the pi squared parameters here. So this is the best case of pi squared as like, to the extent of my abilities to optimize pi squared. Um, so that, that's, that's what it usually is. I mean, you can do sampling if you just feel like uh, writing a quick Python script and calling it a day. Or you can do something else that's going to be 100 times faster and produce better results. And which one is up to you? I don't blame you for going for the Python script because those of us who have been talking about trajectory optimization forever just keep writing papers and never write the software that enables you to do trajectory optimization. So that's why I put the paper writing on hold and I'm now taking several years out of my career to actually write the software once and for all. Um, okay, so now that's all very good, but remember this discovery thing I talked about. This method will not discover contacts that are far away and neither will sampling. So this leads me to the next thing called contact invariant optimization. It's now, there's a new version of it uh, following up after Igor Mordak's work in my lab. Intuition is the same as before. We, we allow virtual contact forces that can act from a distance and then we penalize the distance. And that kind of, it's like an automatic shaping, if you will, that, that is going to guide the optimizer to contact configurations where you get the contacts that you need to accomplish a task. Um, this is how exactly it's done. So now the CIO trick is a cost, is an automatic cost modification as follows. Let's say I have some quadratic on my control forces, which are the output of inverse dynamics. And this, could impl uh, this includes both energy costs and more, more importantly, actuation constraints. So this H is very big in the subspace of the passive degrees of freedom. Now we're going to replace that cost with the following cost. We're going to allow ourselves to invent some virtual forces F in the contact space map them through Jacobian so they go to joint space and then subtract them from that force before penalizing it. So CIO has the power to explain away some of our contact forces before penalizing them. But then it pays a price for doing that. One is a little regularizer and this is the essential term. This looks like complementarity. This is saying that if you made up these forces, you'd better be in contact. And if not, we're going to penalize you proportional to the contact distance times those forces. So now let me give you a simple example of that thing in action. Um, I'm going to load, where is that thing? Where am I supposed to load this? Um, okay, so here what we have is uh, the green mass point mass has to go to the white target, but the green point mass is passive. We can only actuate the red point mass. So this is one of those situations where policy gradients, trajectory optimization sampling will just fail miserably because it will never come up with the idea that it has to go all the way there and hit that green thing before anything good happens. Uh, but thankfully, we now have CIO, which comes to the rescue. Click run, and 
it instantly figures out that it should go and hit that thing. And then uh, there's a continuation mode where I can now disable CIO, run it a bit more, and it cleans it up. Um, and now what I can do is I can go and look what it did over iterations, and I'm going to see something interesting. So these are costs that went down. These things here are the various cost terms. So watch this. So the green thing is the cost for applying non-physical forces on the green point mass. So we want to push to a target we're not allowed to. The optimizer says, well, I'm just going to push it anyway. It's expensive. OK, that's the green cost. But now CAO came in and said, don't worry. I can help you out here. I'm going to pay for it. And so this red thing is the payment from CIO that just kind of cancels the green thing and so makes the green thing uh, affordable for the optimizer. And then as the optimization progresses, you get this dip here. Why? Because we discovered the, the notion of making an actual contact right here. And now the actual contact forces are free, so nobody has to pay for them. And so basically, CAO guided the optimizer to a configuration where actual contact happens, and then from that point, it can take over, and now the CAO forces can drop, and we happily have a solution where, um, hold on, where the thing just does what it's supposed to do. OK, so that's CIO. Um, now, in addition to that, so these, these are um, direct methods based on uh, on inverse dynamics. We can also have a shooting method or a forward method also based on inverse dynamics, which is quite interesting. So here's the idea. So we're literally going to write the time varying dynamics and we treat the control as, acceler uh, as the acceleration as control signal, and that makes the dynamics linear by definition. It's not a linearization, it's not an approximation, it's actually linear. Running cost is going to be whatever cost you want of position and velocity, plus you can put some cost on the forces that come out of inverse dynamics. A Bellman equation looks what you would expect. And now here, when we do the minimum over the, in the Bellman equation, we have to impose visibility constraints, which are basically accelerations such that now space actuation is respected. And if I have a actuation bounds, I prefer to impose them uh, with soft costs, actually, because usually they're not what makes problems complicated. And now you can apply LQR on this thing. So this is meant to be the success of uh, the iterative LQR algorithm that we developed a while ago. Uh, this has the advantage that you can actually search a non-feasible space if you want, and it can do clever things. There are the clever things it does, which I won't talk about. Instead, I'll focus on this thing. So this optimization here, this is called the Hamiltonian optimal control, the Q function in reinforcement learning, is quite essential. This is the greedy one-step optimization of the cost to go with respect to the instantaneous control signals. And you can lift that and say, OK, let's just focus on that problem where this L can be any function of acceleration. It could be optimal value function or it could be something else. And this is an optimization problem which uh, I'm calling goal-directed dynamics. Uh, you can just apply Newton's method to it. So what this is doing is basically regular dynamics says, give me the force, I'll give you the acceleration. Inverse dynamics says, give me the acceleration, I'll give you the force. Goal-directed dynamics says, I'll compute both the force and acceleration for you in a way that's compatible through both the forward and the inverse. And I'll do so while optimizing some cost. And you can give me whatever cost you want, which is this L thing here. Uh, that's a gen if you're familiar with QP methods for solving like balance uh, tasks or also for graph stability, this is a generalization of those. It's not co at all convex, but it can be solved very quickly. What am I trying to solve to this thing? So. Here's my little friend, the humanoid. Now, I can throw it around with the mouse like that. Or I can switch to GDD mode, this is control there. So now when I select the body and I drag it with the mouse, I'm telling it, please accelerate that body in that direction. Find me a control that will accelerate the body in that direction. And it's doing that heroically. Can even invent some kind of crawling. If I want it to be even more aggressive, I can do that. Where is that? So let's just, this control cost is 0.1. So now the guy is really going to kill himself doing what I want. Pretty bold. It even managed to stand up. So this is, you can see how powerful this is. Basically, this I'm constructing a pseudo value function on the fly just by with my mouse cursor. And this is doing instantaneous, greedy, one step optimization. And it's getting all these heroic behaviors that may not be exactly what you want, but you can see there's a lot of power in this thing. 
Uh, and that, that's now built into this new uh, iterative uh, LQR method. Mm, hold on, I need to close this. Um, so one last thing that's not yet implemented, but I'll tell you briefly about it. So if you really want to do policy gradient, you shouldn't do reinforcement learning. You should do something obvious, which is calculus. Uh, here's how you do it. Pick a set of initial states. Forget everything you know about MGPs, because those things are beautiful, but stochastic, and the real world is not. Like, you don't see me shaking, right? And even if I shake, it's because I have epilepsy or some neurological disorder, not because the, phys the quantum noise has gone up, right? Uh, so the world is actually deterministic. The, what complicates physics-based control is the physics and the geometry, not the averaging that's inherent in MGPs. So MGPs are beautiful formalism that solves some problems. The things that I'm trying to solve are essentially orthogonal. And so algorithms from one domain simply don't work well for the other. Bringing me back to policy gradients, pick a bunch of initial states, and that's the only thing that you're going to pick arbitrarily. We roll out trajectory through your forward dynamics, given some policy with some parameters data. You define whatever cost you want, you add up all the costs, and now you have a total cost, which is a function of the trajectories, which is a function of the data. You can hit that thing with the chain rule and get the policy gradient, and you're done. Now, everything here is deterministic except for the set of initial states. This closely corresponds to the idea of doing mini-batch in like computer vision. So, so let's see, you, you train a deep network for vision. What do you do? You pick a few random um, data points for, for, from your database, and that's the only stochastic thing about stochastic gradient descent. Everything is, the rest is you roll out the forward forward, you do back prop backward, it's calculus. This is what we should be doing in, in control too, but we're not. Instead, we're doing something insane, which in vision would be correspond to like, you build a convolutional network with a billion parameters and you start sampling in weight space and hope that thing to discover vision. It's not going to work. What we're doing in control is the equivalent of that. Uh, so you can just do the chain rule and, and be done. And I'm supposed to stop. Here's a summary of, of uh, all the algorithms. So just take 30 seconds. Uh, so you can have these optimizers on the top level, or you can do sampling. An important pattern that emerges is that underneath the high-level optimizer, there are these greedy per-step optimizers which actually do the heavy lifting. So even if you're doing sampling, underneath that there's forward dynamics, which is, which is actually optimization. And that's where the real power of sampling comes from. It doesn't come from the sampling. It comes from the fact that you have a physics simulator. In these other methods, the CIO and GDD I talked about are alternatives to running forward dynamics. They're some kind of low-level solvers that give you a lot of power. Um, and then this analytical policy gradient still needs to be implemented, and one day the software is going to be released, so you can click all the buttons that I just clicked. Thank you. We have time for a question. When did you say the software was released? Did I say that? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, okay. It was also clear, I tell you. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. I should have stuck with teaching. I mean, <laughs> see what a clear uh, speaker. That's good. That's good. <laughs> There's a question behind, behind you, Doro. Hi. So by switching from uh, your decision variable being input to decision variable being acceleration, you've linearized your dynamics, but now you've made your cost function like messier. Does that cause any issues, do you see? It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. Uh, I'm hiding the entire complexity of the problem in the control cost. Uh, and that's a good thing because think about what control costs are. We don't actually care about control. The reason we put these things there is for regularization. We really care about the state costs, which tell us what we want to achieve, where we want to go. Control costs are there for regularization anyway. I'm happy to dump all the garbage there. It, it has some other interesting properties. Once dynamics, dynamics are linear, when you do uh, dynamic programming with approximate value functions, you like normally you would accumulate errors all the time because you're linearizing. Now you don't linearize anything. Now the when you the, now the errors show up, but then they stay the same through time. So it has interesting properties. Uh, over, over there. Great talk. So my question is, so you use, you use finite difference to calculate the velocity and acceleration. Does this affect the precision of your trajectory optimization algorithm? Otherwise, I mean, do you have to use very dense um, grades in order to get a high precision? Um, so whenever you're simulating physics, you're going to discretize the time axis. That's unfortunate, but that's the way computers work. 
uh, it holds for simulation and everything else as well, not, not just optimization. But you can think of it, I mean, once you define a discrete time problem, you can just think of it as being the problem and solve it as well as you can. And then, yeah, the discretization introduced some error, but that doesn't matter. I mean, that, that discretization error is consistent with the discretization error in the simulator. Like, they find a difference the same way, so it's not blowing up anything that wasn't there in the simulation already. All right, let's thank Emo again.